Hello, this is John Mitchell. Welcome to Business Basics. In this lesson, Lesson 35, we'll be continuing to look at ways to cut costs by more than 86% or providing each offering, whether it's a product or a service. And our topic today will be serving social purposes and operating in the ideal location. Uh, we'd like to quote from 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1-4 through 4 in the New King James Version to begin. The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So in this lesson, we'll be continuing to examine, uh, and this will be our final lesson to do so, the minimum business model for reducing all costs by 96%. Our investigation considers what can be accomplished by serving social purposes by operating in an ideal location. So let's begin by understanding how social purposes can help lower costs for all stakeholders. So uh, to inspire us as we begin this section, let me quote from uh, the book of First Chronicles, chapter 9, verses 28 to 31. Now some of them were in charge of the serving vessels, for they brought them in and took them out by count. Some of them were appointed over the furnishings and over all the implements of the sanctuary and over the fine flour and the wine and the oil, and the incense, and the spices. And some of the sons of the priests made the ointment of the spices. Metatiah of the Levites, the firstborn of Shalom, the Korahite, had the entrusted office over the things that were baked in the pans. I became interested in how serving social purposes can help reduce costs while attending a lecture at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, sponsored by the Legatum Center for Development and Entrepreneurship, which educates entrepreneurs in the least economically developed nations about how to help people leave poverty. The lecturer of this day was Mr. Fernando Nilo, founder and CEO of Recycla Chile, the first Latin American recycling company to handle electronic products, such as computers, fax machines, printers, and cell phones, in the most environmentally friendly ways. In Chile, at the time, such products were 2% of the volume in landfills, but contributed over 70% of all toxic waste. If you can keep electronic products out of landfills, you can avoid poisoning future generations. In addition, much of such discarded equipment was either functional or could be easily repaired. Recycle Chile erased the memories of any usable electronic gear and supplied them for free to organizations serving the poor. As you can see, the company's basic work contributed to important social purposes uh, that no other enterprise was addressing in Chile at the time, reducing toxic pollution and equipping organizations to serve the poor. How does serving these purposes affect the firm's costs? First, uh, customer companies were willing to pay high prices to have their electronic gear hauled away and properly recycled in order to gain the green seal they recycle at Chile used to certify those customers were responsibly disposing of all their electronic gear. Green Seal products are much more appealing to manufacturers and environmentally conscious customers. Other Latin American recyclers, in contrast, received no pay for disposing of electronic products because they didn't provide such certifications. As a result of receiving such pay, Recycler Chile's operating costs were 60% less than for many competitors in other nations. Recycler Chile, the second, picked suppliers that properly recycled the disassembled equipment. As a result, the pain suppliers would do more extensive processing. Some of Recycla Chile's recycling costs were higher than those of competitors. Such increased costs were more than offset by the value of receiving customer payments for the recycling. Third, because of its exemplary practices, Recycla Chile won many environmental and entrepreneurial awards. The company's founder met with the CEOs of many large environmentally conscious companies or receiving recycling awards. The CEO to CEO contacts help lead some of the companies to hire Recycle Chile. Such recognition helped reduce marketing costs while allowing the firm to be much more successful in gaining customers, also reducing fixed costs as a percentage of sales. Mr. Nilo didn't stop there in providing social benefits. He also chose to hire 
only ex-convicts to work in his recycling facility, as well as to pick up and to deliver recycled goods. Many such employees wouldn't otherwise have been able to find honest work in Chile. As a result, they were often highly motivated to do well and didn't require high wages. Here are the three most important ways that hiring ex-convicts reduced the firm's cost. First, wages were lower. Second, productivity was higher. And third, customers were added to like the idea of recycling people by giving them another chance to become productive. Such added volume further reduced marketing and fixed costs as a percentage of sales. In 2007, Mr. Eli wrote a book about his company and his business model called The New Trash of the 21st Century. During the MIT lecture, Mr. Nilo mentioned that he would be glad to assist entrepreneurs who wanted to set up similar operations in other undeveloped countries. If that's of interest, you should contact him through his company's website, which is www.recycla.cl. Even if you don't intend to become an electronic recycler, what lessons does this example suggest for developing a minimum best practice? The primary lesson is to add several social purposes to your business model. To do so, apply the lens of such social purposes to help you anticipate cost reduction opportunities that you might otherwise miss. Here are some examples of social purposes and associated cost reduction opportunities that might apply to your situation. First, improve the environment. So let me list some here. You would gain income from recycling. You would attract environmentally concerned customers more easily and less expensively. You would charge higher prices to offset some of any increased costs. You could lower your operating costs by wasting fewer materials. You could draw the attention of more potential customers and hire a more determined workforce through positive publicity. And finally, you could obtain grants from governments to do important tasks that no one else uh, will pay for. Second, you can reduce disease. And here are three elements here. You can sell some offerings to public health agencies and governments with less marketing costs. Second, you can receive support from government uh, agencies when selling to physicians and hospitals to further reduce marketing costs. And third, open doors to selling related products and reduce any shared costs of sales and distribution. So here's the third idea. Hire poor people who couldn't otherwise find honest work. You first lower the cost of wages and benefits. Second, you gain a more productive workforce. Third, you increase sales to organizations and individuals that care about poor people. Fourth, you qualify to compete for government programs aimed at reducing poverty. And fifth, you receive foundation and government grants to help educate and train workers. So the next idea is to certify customer and supplier practices. Here there are four benefits. You acquire the most socially conscious customers and suppliers more easily, reducing marketing and operating costs. You can charge higher prices to customers and pay less to suppliers due to economic benefits of certification, thus reducing total costs as a percentage of sales to obtain free positive publicity. And you can add consulting services to make it less costly to work with customers and suppliers to reform their practices, generating extra income uh, to subsidize costs that cannot otherwise be eliminated. The next idea is to provide essential services to poor people who otherwise wouldn't receive them, such as potable water, electricity, waste removal, telephone, etc. So here are some of the benefits of doing this on the cost side. Qualify for lower cost financing from governments and foundations. Potentially receive ongoing uh, operating subsidies from governments and foundations. Third, develop infrastructure scale that makes it possible to also provide services to those in nearby areas who can afford to pay. Uh, and then next, as more people are served, lower cost due to increasing economies of scale. And finally, perform profitable activities that are related to the basic offerings. For example, a treadle pump the seller may be able to make sales of drip irrigation equipment as some of those whose profits rapidly expand from using treadle pumps. I'm sure you have your own ideas as well, all of which will undoubtedly be better than mine. Please feel free to share ideas with me. So what's the key cost paying lesson from serving social purposes? You can help reduce your and your stakeholders' costs as a percentage of selling prices by 96% in ways that will expand your organization's profits through revising your business model to serve many beneficial social purposes. So here I'd like to share six assignments with you. Uh, first, identify 10 social purposes that could help you lower costs to below that of your, those of your competitors. Second, examine each of the 10 social purposes to consider what the cost, profit, and cash flow potentials are for serving each by evaluating A, what you can charge, B, what customers will be attracted, C, what, how large can the organization's revenues grow, fourth, 
or D rather, what advantages you can gain in accessing and pleasing customers, uh, and E, what free resources you can draw on, F, how productivity can be enhanced, G, what proprietary knowledge advantages you will gain, and how you be able to employ such advantages, H, what elements of cost will decline and by how much when serving each current or potential customer, and I, what effects on each stakeholder will be. Three, consider the difficulty of operating with each social purpose. Four, look at the risk involved if your business model doesn't work well in providing each social purpose. Five, select one social purpose to focus on the first and develop a plan to adjust your business model to optimize the advantages offered by the first social purpose. Six, later add other social purposes by repeating steps one through five. Now let's shift our focus to the second idea in this lesson. What location should be part of your minimum business model? Here I'd like to begin by quoting from the uh, book of Ezra, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Then the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Edo, prophets, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem, in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. So Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Zadok, rose up and began to build the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, helping them. When I teach new entrepreneurs, sometimes during the very first class, someone uh, will ask where to locate a business. It's good for you to ask and thoughtfully answer that question. I find that most people select the sites for their business model solely on where they currently live. Just my observation, check announcements of companies moving their headquarters, then find where the CEO lives, and you'll usually see the new location as less of a commute to and from the CEO's home. Professor Michael Porter from Harvard Business School has done research concerning how location affects cost and effectiveness. He points out that ideal locations are far from obvious. For instance, farmers in Israel lower the cost for selling and distributing flowers to other Middle Eastern countries by first air freighting their offerings to the flower market in Holland, even though the new owners will then have to air freight the same flowers from Holland to their countries. Although the cost of transportation is obviously much higher, the total cost is much less for connecting the Israeli growers with Arab buyers and distributing the flowers than by seeking direct sales. That beneficial result occurs because the Holland flower market is so efficient in bringing buyers and sellers together. Another example of an efficient central market may encourage you to consider alternative locations. If you want to buy or sell 100 shares of publicly held stock in the United States, you can probably make the transaction by paying a brokerage fee of $5 or less and paying or receiving money based on a spread between the quoted buy and sell prices of, of five, excuse me, 0.5% or less. Now imagine you want to buy or sell the same dollar value stock in a privately held company of the same size. Both the buyer and seller will probably have to employ business brokers, attorneys, accountants, and complete quite a bit of paperwork. Closing the transaction could easily cost all parties over $10,000 in total. Although many people work hard to pick the best location for a business facility, they almost always, uh, almost, excuse me, they almost never look at the whole value chain to determine what the overall cost impact will be on all stakeholders. When most people think about supply chains, they often focus on just the people who supply them and the people they sell to. The complete value chain, however, is much larger, beginning with those who contribute to design offerings, continuing uh, through to those who purchase from salvagers for reuse or entirely different uses, until nothing from the original offering is still being employed in any form. While considering the ideal locations for a business model, you should be open to changing the business model to reflect what you learn about the benefits and unusual circumstances of attractive locations. Let me outline 11 of the most important factors that could affect your decision. First, investigate price effects. The lowest cost market for producing something is seldom the highest price market for selling something. Look for where the spread between prices and costs will be the highest and most sustained because the extra value will be delivered to stakeholders by being present in that market. And that way your costs will be lower relative to your prices. Yes, you can get your haircut less expensive in the Amazon rainforest than in downtown Manhattan, but the prices of the offerings in most organizations are also very low in the Amazon rainforest. Second, consider how base demand shifts. As I mentioned before, increased revenues allow businesses to spread their fixed and semi-fixed costs over a larger base, reduce these costs as a percentage of sales and per offering. No offering is purchased at exactly the same rate from one geographical location to another. That's because some offerings are more relevant in certain areas, 
such as very warm clothing in Antarctica, while customer preferences favor certain locales. Listening to live jazz and bars is much more popular in New Orleans than in most other places. Most people only think in terms of separating supply from demand when considering locations. In the minimum business model, you will often seek to serve and supply from the same place. Why? It gives you a greater ability to understand your market and to focus on providing what's needed very rapidly and more appropriately. Third, quickly deliver custom offerings. Unless the price premium is unaffordable for custom offerings, most people prefer them to standard offerings. Many people also like custom offerings to be immediately available. As an example, some tailors in Hong Kong will put your custom-made suit in the morning delivery just after lunch. If you don't like some little aspect of what was done, the change can be promptly made, and you'll be happily wearing your new suit just a few minutes later. Let's look at four. Uh, make it painless to buy. Imagine instead that the tailor shop for custom suits is located in a hotel where you're staying and the fittings can be done in your room. Such extra convenience would make it harder to resist having a beautiful new suit that has your name sewn on the lining in gorgeous calligraphy. Five, be impossible to avoid. Most people like fresh flowers, but they often think, don't think to buy any. Why? Nothing reminds them to do so. One florist in New York City overcame that limitation by putting astonishingly beautiful arrangements throughout one of Manhattan's most popular hotels, the Pierre, a located shop opposite the lobby's most impressive arrangement. After viewing such an arrangement, I've often found myself unexpectedly wandering into that shop to order flowers for my business meetings in Manhattan, my hotel room, and friends who live nearby. Six. Be where you can make people feel great. For many years, I regularly traveled to San Francisco. For convenience, I usually stayed in the same hotel, the Highway Union Square. Because of the nice weather, it was almost always pleasant to be outdoors when I was in the vicinity, and I would uh, walk in my meet to my meetings. The hotel's daytime doorman made a point to remember my name. Whenever he saw me, within 50 yards, he would just put a big grin, shout my name, wave, and make me feel like the King of England. Actually, my tipping was stimulated by all this extra attention. Seven, use free resources to your best advantage. I don't know about you, but I enjoy beautiful views. As part of your business, you could supply such a view at great expense for stakeholders, or you could just pick a location where those who visit will enjoy such a wonderful view at no added cost. Many of our firm's offices have been located on upper floors of buildings or buildings located at top hills where we paid no premium for enjoying spectacular vistas. Similarly, there may be some wonderful place to visit near your place of business that will attract stakeholders. Our consulting firm was located for many years in the middle of Harvard University, so we could speedily travel to schools' libraries. During those years, we often attracted clients who were in town to visit professors who had relatives attending the university. Eight, consider the minimum configuration. I've often seen tutors bring lessons at quiet, out-of-the-way tables in libraries, software consultants training clients at coffee bar nooks, and venture capitalists listening to pictures from entrepreneurs at outdoor picnic tables and office parks. In most cases, using such comfortable facilities cost nothing extra. Nine, turn accessibility into lower costs. The more accessible you are, the easier it is for prospective customers to decide to do business with you. But accessibility doesn't have to be expensive. For instance, rather than an expensive face to sell coffee in a high rent warm weather neighborhood, find a nearby public place, acquire a, an inexpensive municipal license to operate there, and operate from a beautiful cart where you brew and serve great coffees. If you find a public place with much foot, foot traffic, it will be closer to many potential customers than would be the nearest coffee bar that's renting expensive space. 10. Offer a specialty customers cannot obtain elsewhere. This way your business can become a destination for those who are intrigued by what you offer. Because there is no other source, you can also charge prices that optimize costs for stakeholders and you. A test of a desirable specialist of people come to your location in that city from other cities just to acquire what you offer. Eleven, pick locations that greatly boost productivity. I long ago discovered I'm much more productive in some locations than in others. As an example, uh, I attended the Salzburg Festival in Austria for a few summers because I could get so much work done while studying in the public gardens there. Eventually, I learned how to achieve similar levels of personal productivity in my hometown. Naturally, that learned to cut expenses quite a lot. To deepen your understanding of operating in the ideal location, I invite you to reread the golf caddy example. It's on pages 5 through 8 of The Ultimate Competitive Advantage. What's the key cost reducing point about location? You can reduce your and all stakeholders' costs compared to prices by 96%. The ways to expand your profits through revising your business model provide just the minimum best practice in the optimal location. 
So here I have uh, five assignments for you. First, identify three locations that will help you gain a lower cost compared to competitors that you have now. Second, examine each of the three locations to consider what the cost, profit, and cash flow potentials are for each by evaluating A, what you can charge, B, what customers will be attracted, C, how much the organization's revenues will grow, D, what advantages you can gain access to pleasing customers, E, what free resources you can draw on, F, what productivity can be enhanced and how, A, excuse me, G, what proprietary knowledge advantages you will gain and how you'll be able to employ such advantages, H, what elements of cost will decline and by how much with each current or potential customer, I, what effects are on each stakeholder. Then uh, third, consider the difficulty of operating each location. Fourth, what the risk involved if your business model doesn't work well in that location. And then five, select one location to focus on first. Develop a plan to adjust your business model to optimize the advantages and unique characteristics that location offers. So I hope this lesson has been a great blessing to you and that it will help you to create the wonderful, great minimum business model that will um, enormously benefit you and your stakeholders, whether it be customers, beneficiaries, or just uh, simply end users. So in the meantime, uh, may God bless you, your family, and all you do in the name of Jesus. I'll talk to you soon so we continue to learn ways to make 8,000 times more benefit through having a for-profit or non-profit organization. Goodbye for now.